In a world of so many cheap DIY 3D printer kits that the market is starting to feel a little oversaturated, is there room for maybe just one more with an extra trick or two up its sleeve? Well, there's only one way to find out. Now in the box before me are the parts we need to build the P802QR2 3D printer. It's a 3D printer that's currently available on Gearbest for about $229 US. So not a lot more than something like the A988, but it offers a couple of features the A988 does not. It offers an all metal frame, which isn't the all metal frame that people are getting used to say from the CR10 where it's extrusion. It's more like the acrylic pieces that were on traditional printer kits, but cut out of metal. The big feature on this one that sets it apart from the rest is that $229 it includes dual extrusion. Now this uses a dual extrusion technology where there's two hot ends, two extruders with two motors and two Bowden tubes. So calibration is a little more difficult than something like on the Prusa multi-material kit, which has one hot end that pumps out up to four different materials, but it doesn't waste as much because it doesn't require a purge block. So all this sounds really good on paper. It has a similar build volume to the A98 at about 220 by 220 by 200. Um, and it offers an aluminum heat bed and all that type of stuff. So the features are very similar to other printers at its price point, but with the added addition of an additional extruder. So is this printer gonna be worth your schmeckles? Well, there's only one way to find out and that's to get it together. But first we have to get it out of the box. Well, here we have the contents of the box laid out for you to see. Before we get started, I am going to mention that this review was sponsored by Gearbest. There's no money exchanged in this particular situation, they just gave me the printer in the hopes that I would give an honest review. All the opinions I'm going to express are my own, and it's going to be 100% truthful. If I don't like this printer, you guys are going to know by the end of it. Well, here's all the parts spread out, so let's go ahead and dig into it. Like every other 3D printer kit, we start off with our NEMA 17 motors. There are six of them because we have the XYZ plus two for the extruders. They're the typical fare with the removable uh, connector on it, so not hardwired, which is nice. We also include an LCD screen, which is mounted up near the top of it uh, in behind this particular piece of aluminum here. In terms of the aluminum quality, I would say it's a huge upgrade over the acrylic. While it doesn't add a ton more rigidity because it is fairly thin, it is strong enough that it shouldn't give in to too many vibrations, and unlike the acrylic, it's going to withstand the test of time better because it's not going to be prone to cracking. The smooth rods and threaded rods came in this tube, which unfortunately showed how much it had been bounced around in shipping. While the rods don't look like they're damaged, it did pop the caps off of both ends, and I almost lost the rods when I pulled it out of the box, not realizing that they weren't end-capped. There are a few 3D printed pieces on here and the quality looks like it's pretty good. The layers are smooth and consistent. There's no uh, crazy warping or anything on them. So I think they're gonna work just fine. And they do feel like they're pretty solidly done. Something I hadn't noted when I originally took this kit out is that it comes with an inductive sensor, which is super helpful. For those of you that don't know what an inductive sensor does, it has the ability to sense metal. And in this case, it has an all aluminum print bed. So if you don't put it together just properly or if the bed is uh, perhaps warped, this will allow it to scan the bed, figure out how far away it is, and if there's any inconsistencies in it, and compensate for it. So that's going to be super helpful. The aluminum thickness of this build plate is pretty standard, and it's the typical setup where you have the printed circuit board attached to the back of it, so it's going to run on 12 volts, and we'll probably expect it to get somewhere around 100 degrees Celsius for maximum temperature, which is pretty standard for these kits. And this is the standard type of power supply you're going to find in most of these kits. It's a little light, um, which usually means that it's not necessarily the highest quality, but as long as it's going to output the proper amount of power, has the proper amount of cooling, it should do just fine. Also, with every one of these kits, you always want to make sure your power supply is set to the proper voltage. Here in Canada, and also in the US, we'd be running on 110 volts, so make sure that that switch is set to 110 before firing it up. 
It did come with some masking tape for the bed, but unfortunately it didn't really withstand the trip. There's two holes punched through it, but masking tape's cheap and I tend to print directly onto the bed anyway, so... In terms of a main board, we get you what we traditionally expect with one of these kits. This one's been zone star stamped, and one of the things I do appreciate on it is that it doesn't have the quick disconnect for the hotbed. This has been an issue in the past because it doesn't really handle the amperage properly for that type of uh, that type of setup, and it can overheat, burn out, and every once in a while it has actually caused a fire. Now that's not to cause a panic because they are rare and fairly fair in between, but keep in mind that you always want to keep an eye on your 3D printer when you're using it. The hot end assembly comes pre-assembled and ready to go. Here you can see that there are in fact two hot ends mounted in here. There's also a uh, vortex style fan with a part cooling fan built into it. That's actually been a complaint against a lot of the cheaper kits is that they don't come with a part cooling fan which means that they're terrible for printing PLA. So while I'm not going to get ahead of myself that does offer some hope for some decent quality prints right out of the box. In this design the end stop for the X is actually built into the hot ends the switch right here. There is some acrylic included just to remind you of where it came from. This here will be the spool holders for the dual spools that are going to feed it, if we choose to use it. It's the traditional acrylic affair. It's been coated with some brown paper to stop it from getting scratched in shipping, and they generally handle it pretty well. There's not a lot of force put on them, so yeah, that'll be fine. Also included in this kit is a USB cable and an SD card, and if tradition holds, the SD card is going to be where we're going to find the instructions for building this. The other awesome thing is that the screws came in a box rather than in a Ziploc bag and they're already split apart which should make assembly a lot easier. And speaking of ease of assembly, we also get the traditional set of 3D printer assembly parts. So we have a Phillips head screwdriver, a pair of flush cutters. Now this is interesting, we have a pair of tweezers which actually look pretty good on the camera but they're plastic. So. I think they're going to be for positioning some of the finer parts. I don't think they're going to withstand the test of time very well if you're going to use them for any, you know, actual work. And of course, just like every piece of IKEA furniture, we get a varying range. We get a varying range of Allen wrenches. Well, with that said and all the parts before us, really there's nothing else to do but do the assembly. And thanks to my flux capacitor shirt, what's going to take hours for me is only going to take minutes for you guys. So let's get it built. Enjoy the show and hopefully we'll have our first print off of it real soon. Well, it's been a few days. I built it, I calibrated it, and I tested it. I had some successful prints, as well as some messes formerly known as prints. So I've got the printer, I've got the prints, and I've got my coffee. So it's time to see where things stand. I'm going to start off with the things that I see as being potential problems for this printer. One of them is pretty much a deal breaker if you don't have access to tools or another 3D printer, and the other one's a design choice problem that doesn't limit the functionality of the printer, but I think it could have been done a little bit better. You see, the assembly of this printer was actually very, very easy. They provided instructions while they didn't have the best English in them, did have really detailed photos and pictures that allowed you to see where everything went together. So assembly of this project only took three or four hours, and it was quite smooth until I got to the point where I had to mount the Y-axis motor. 
You see, the Y motor mounts to the back using a metal bracket. In the diagram, it clearly shows that the two holes that that bracket mount to on the frame are slightly offset, so that when the motor is mounted, its spindle X ends up in the middle, lined up with the pulley in the front. However, on the test unit I received, the two holes are actually drilled dead center. So when the motor is installed in the proper configuration, it causes the belt to be misaligned, so it comes off on an angle and actually rubs against the edge of the motor. Reversing the bracket causes the belt to become properly aligned front to back, but then it ends up rubbing on the undercarriage, which is no good either. My initial instinct was to just drill the two holes where they're supposed to be and finish the assembly. I reached out to Gearbest, who said no problem, they would mail me a properly fixed part, but that was going to take time, and I'm a maker. So I jumped into Fusion 360, and I modeled up a new bracket, and that bracket put the motor into the proper position with the holes where they are. I've gone ahead and released that model onto Thingiverse so that if you end up with one of these units and it has the same problem, you can print that part off on another printer and be up and running. Next up was the power switch. I was really excited to see that they included a power switch and a socket for the power cord. Unfortunately, when I saw where they were going to mount it, I was a little less enthusiastic. You see, the power switch and the plug are actually meant to be mounted directly into the metal frame, underneath the power supply. So each time you would reach in to turn it on and off, you would be putting your hand in underneath where it connects to the 12 volt and 110 volts or 230 volts uh, on the power supply. There is a plastic protection piece over top of those terminals, but I often reach blindly back in there and start hitting switches, and I could foresee a time where I'd reach back and accidentally brush that safety piece out of the way and shock myself. I hit Thingiverse, and I wasn't the only person that had had this particular thought, and I was able to print off a nice plastic bracket that surrounds the bottom of the power supply and moves the power switch and the outlet outwards. So it completely covers up the terminals on the power supply and puts the switch in a much better position in my opinion. In, other, in terms of other negatives, I guess the other big one is the fact that this printer suffers from the same thing a lot of these kits suffer from. The heat bed cables don't have any strain relief on them whatsoever, so they added a little bit of tape underneath which is kind of like a stop gate measure. But it is something I'm going to have to address in the future. I will be designing a bracket to hold these properly in place so it's not constantly wearing against the solder points. There's also some interesting design things that I found as I built it. For example, this is the first printer I've ever seen that actually has the smooth rods with threaded holes in the end. So if you see, there's screws in the front here that go directly into the threaded rods. So the threaded rods are actually attached to the metal frame. I wasn't sure how that was going to affect build quality and print quality, but it seems to have no negative effects, so it was a, a neat design choice anyways. So with the printer built, it was time to see what it could do. And to do the first test, I turned to the included G-code on the microSD card. Now for anybody who's ever built one of these kits, you know that the included code isn't always fantastic, so I was a little apprehensive as to whether or not it was going to work well. Well, I picked out a simple design, which was just a simple two-color test cube, and to my surprise, it completed without any problems whatsoever. The color separation is great. It shows that maybe the heads aren't perfectly aligned in the test code, but it was certainly promising. So with our first test print out of the way, it was time to move on to something a little more complicated. On the microSD card, I found sample G-code for a two-toned cat. So I printed it off, and once again, not a lot of struggle there. So the cat completed in just over an hour and all the colors are pretty well separated. Again, it shows that the uh, offset for the two print heads may not be perfect in their sample G-code, but it at least shows that it's going to be able to work. During operation, the audio level is about the same or lower than a CR-10, and I plan to dampen that even more by adding some feet to it in the future. I did all my prints from the included micro SD card reader. Uh, the LCD includes the typical five button type of interface that's included in a lot of these uh, the ramps kits. It's okay, I prefer the one with the jog dial versus the buttons, but it works, you know, it does what it's supposed to. Well, with the first few test prints looking all right, it was time to move on to slicing my own. I started developing a printer profile in Cura, and after playing with it for a little while and a few misaligned prints, I got a test cube that looks pretty promising. The alignment again isn't totally perfect and it is going to require a little bit of playing with to get it dead on, but it was certainly enough for me to move on to starting to print some other prints. 
So for the first prints, I moved on to our good friend Benji. Benchy is often one of the first prints people put off of a printer because it's a decent benchmark as to how the printer is going to perform. I printed both a single and a dual color Benchy, and to be completely honest, I was pretty blown away with how they turned out. There was absolutely no curling in the front, the layer lines were nice and even, the text on the bottom of them was legible, the overhangs were well done, and on the multicolor one, there was a little bit of roughness because of the minimal amount of material for the second color it was putting down, say, around the door entries. But overall, the color separation's great, there's not a lot of bleeding, occasionally a little speck of color, but that's pretty common with pretty much any multicolor printer that uses dual extrusion like this. Well, with my Benchy test complete, it was time to really put this printer through its paces. And the best way to torture a printer like this is to use the lattice torture cube. This is the very first attempt I had to print off a lattice, and it's always interesting to watch and see how well it's going to come across. It's kind of nail-biting when those forks all separate and then they try to come back together, but thanks to that nice and powerful parts cooling fan in the front, there was no curling to the parts and it completed super successful. If you look closely, of course, there is some roughness in the overhangs, but this completed pretty much as well as I've seen any other printer complete it so far. Well, with the torture prints out of the way, it was time to move on to something a little more fun. So I printed this MakerBot Cupcake. In terms of the quality of the print, it pretty much speaks for itself. There's very little bleed over between the multicolors. Everything's separated and vibrant. It's printed at 0.2 millimeter layer heights, and it looks nice and smooth, and I was genuinely impressed with it. So after that, I started asking around in terms of what else I should print on it to test it, and people recommended switching to an organic model. The one that was suggested for me was this Demoness Bust. So it's a multicolor, which I printed in black and gray, and it turned out really nice. Uh, it did highlight the fact that the overhangs don't always detach great. That may be partially a product of the PLA that I'm using, because in some places it detached great, in other places not so much, and it really depended on which material the overhangs were coming into contact with. In addition, there were some overhang issues with the chin, which, even though it had support, shows a little bit of imperfection, so I'll have to see if I can address that with the profile or not. Anybody that knows me knows I'm a huge Super Mario Brothers fan, so when I found this multicolored Super Mario Mushroom, well, I just had to print it off. This one really shows how well it can perform the overhangs, because there's a fairly decent overhang on the front of the mushroom cap. And the layer lines are nice and smooth. You would think almost that it had some sort of support material to keep them in line. And uh, again, clean separation of the colors. And now it's time for the most complicated print in the entire setup, even though it really shouldn't have been. This is a low poly Darth Vader that prints in two colors. And it kept failing. In fact, it took me four tries to get it to print successfully. So the first three prints failed uh, as they printed up the legs. It never really got past the kneecaps. So finally, after watching it, I saw that the printer seemed to be skipping the first layer of the feet. So sure enough, I still had the model opened up in Cura, and when I looked at it, it for the second extruder, it wasn't starting until it was on the second layer, layer which meant that the feet were being printed 0.2 millimeters above the bed. They were getting terrible adhesion, and then they were easily getting knocked loose. By deleting and re-adding the model, I was able to solve the problem, but I haven't been able to replicate it since, so it was a weird little cure bug that I guess isn't documented yet. And of course, because of the design, I wanted to make sure that as the printer gets higher, that there isn't more artifacting in the prints. And if you want to print tall and fast, vase mode is the way to go. So I snagged this goblet design, and I printed it off, and it printed flawlessly. There's literally no quality difference as you go up higher. It's nice and smooth all the way across. Then I got overzealous when I pulled it off the bed and ended up breaking it. And unfortunately, that's just a weak spot in the design where it V's out and then goes straight up. And uh, yeah, I should have taken more time to remove it. Instead, I just grabbed it and yanked. All the prints I did test were done in PLA. However, I did want to make sure that this printer would be able to handle more. So I went ahead and heated the heat bed up to 100 degrees. As you can see, it didn't take long to complete it, although it did take more than a few minutes to hit it. Uh, it had no problem holding 100 degrees, and then when I tried to push it to 110, it really slowed down around the 103, 104 mark. So you can pretty much guarantee to get 100 degrees on it, but you can't guarantee yourself you're going to get more. I also heated both extruders up to 250 degrees, which it again hit no problem, so you should be fine for most types of material. 
With this type of boat and setup, however, without modification, I wouldn't recommend flexible material. It is going to most likely get gummed up in the works and the prints probably will not complete. So we've assembled the printer and we've seen the prints and now it's time to see where things lie. Well, let's start off by doing the pros and the cons. Here's the pros as I see them. It has well-documented assembly documentation with accurate diagrams, which means that most novices are going to be able to pick up this type of design and put it together without too much struggle. It has well-organized parts, everything was compartmentalized into bags, and especially the screws and springs were well compartmentalized as well, being in a plastic container and separated. It's a dual extruder allowing you to use multicolor or multi-material prints, which is going to be great for, uh, say, you wanted to use something that dissolves for your overhangs. It's an all-metal frame with mostly metal parts, and it seems more than solid. I had called it aluminum at the beginning, but I think it's something stronger. It seems like it's probably sheet metal that's been cut. It's got autonomous printing using the SD card reader, and it has a okay LCD on it. And it supports open source firmware, which means you're not stuck with repetitive firmware when you get it. You can actually upgrade it to something else that you like better. Now it's time for the cons. Well, the big con was the improperly drilled holes for the Y motor mount. So again, if you don't have access to a 3D printer or a drill that can drill through this type of hardened metal, then you're going to have trouble putting it together. It's got questionable power button and power cable placement. I, again, I think that uh, if they just added the protective casing with the power supply, it would be absolutely no issue there. And it has a less than stellar LCD screen button combination. Again, the, it's more of a personal choice, I guess, but I prefer the jog dial to the buttons. Personally, I really like this printer, and I wasn't really expecting to. I mean, it's it's a pr pretty dirt cheap solution. In fact, it's the cheapest multicolor printer I could find at the time. I wasn't expecting a lot from its performance, but at 60 millimeters a second, it completed the vast majority of the prints that I threw at it without any type of problem. And the quality on them has been far above what I was expecting. And with tuning, I think I can only make it better. There are, of course, the negative points that I've listed, and with the exception of the buttons versus the dial, there isn't much that somebody with a little bit of technical knowledge and the willingness to learn can't fix themselves. I also think it brings great value for money. It's got six motors and reusable extruders and really like the power supply and the control board. They're all great if you wanted to build a larger custom printer or whatever later on. So it can sort of grow with you, which is great. And while I was originally concerned about the thinness of the metal, it seems more than solid enough to be able to handle at least 60 millimeters a second, which is pretty much all you can ask for for a printer like this, to be honest. So if you decide you want to get one and you want to support the channel, I'm including an affiliate link for this purchase on Gearbest in the description below. If you want to get one without supporting the channel, obviously it's very easy to find on Gearbest, so just go ahead and snag your own. So that's it for this review. This printer really did end up surprising me. I wasn't expecting it to perform as well as it did. Over the next few weeks, there's going to be some projects surrounding this as I 3D print a bracket to mount an orange pie to it and then install Octoprint. I'm also going to be designing a bracket for the cable management for the hot bed, and I'm going to be designing a bracket that allows us to mount a webcam directly to the bed, which is going to give you those really nice time-lapse videos because it looks like the print is actually staying stationary when the webcam is moving with the bed. So if you found this review helpful, toss me a thumbs up to let me know. If you're new here, subscribe and click the bell so you're notified when I release new content, especially since I am going to be releasing upgrades and stuff for this printer over the next few weeks and possibly months. If you have other test materials or test prints you want me to run through it, go ahead and toss them in the comments below and I will do my best to accommodate you. And until next time, stay creative.